Thank you very much, Steffi. Uh, it's great to be here this morning and to be moderating this panel. This is the first of three panels on generative AI. We're going to be talking about the challenges of generative AI, and then we're going to be talking about the opportunities and the ethics. So just to set the scene a little for that discussion, um, last year, I think it looked as though AI was um, sliding over the top of the Gartner hype cycle and dropping from the peak of inflated expectations into the trough of disillusionment. And then along came ChatGPT. Uh, and within a week, it had a million users and everyone who used it was wowed by what was going on. Money has been pouring into generative AI startups and then Sequoia Capital came out with a big report saying it was going to create trillions of dollars of economic value. And certainly, as Steffi was saying, it's been the talk of DLD this week. I've been keeping my ears and my notebook open, and uh, I just read out some of the things that I've heard. Um, Scott Galloway, of course, said 2023 is clearly the year of AI. Uh, some other comments. Chat GPT is scary impressive, but not scary good. It's going to transform every part of the creator economy. It's just going to flood the world with more bullshit, and we have enough of that already. It's going to kill the dominance of Google Search. It's going to reinforce the dominance of Google Search. It's going to give media organizations more value because they stand behind the information they create. I like that one. <laughs> and my favorite from Phil Libin is, chat GBT is like a corporate CEO, overconfident and wrong. <laughs> Um, I asked ChatGPT itself what its own limitations were, and it confessed to having a limited understanding of context, a lack of common sense, biased training data, and potential for misuse, spreading financial market disinformation, for example. And one developer I um, spoke to here put it more succinctly and said, it hallucinates facts. So there's lots to talk about. And we have a panel which is positively bursting with human intelligence. So while that is still valuable, let's hear from them. Uh, we're uh, uh, we're going to go straight down the line. Um, we have a, a lot of speakers on the panel, so we're going to have to keep this quite short and punchy. But I'd like each of you to identify a challenge of generative AI that we ought, ought to be thinking about and talking about. So start with you, Bjorn. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe that on our way towards true artificial intelligence, we will see ever more powerful intelligence out there. But if it's really intelligent, it should also be becoming more accessible to, you, to the user, understand the user better. And the question is just how and when we will get there. Now, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future, but one thing's for certain. The more people will actually join in, the more clever and intelligent minds, the sooner and the better the solution will be. Now, AI has been recently driven by open software that we had there, which allowed us to stand on the shoulders of giants. And secondly, the compute keeping up with our growing models. When we joined generative artificial intelligence research, I, however, got a bit frustrated because if you extrapolated the research there, it was clear that in a not too distant future, it would probably be just a few tech companies who would have the computational resources with these ever-growing models to do that research. Now, I guess if anything, stable diffusion last year has proven that you can democratize that research and with that allow the millions of entrepreneurs, but also researchers, to again join in by making smaller models more powerful and eventually competitive with what existed beforehand. Now still, when we're looking at language models, I believe that we are still seeing, with what you've just mentioned, th this trend to ever-growing model sizes. But how can that be? I mean, our human brains haven't changed in size since the Stone Age, and now we are driving cars and talking to people from the other end of the uh, globe here at DLD. Um, I guess there are ways to address this challenge of making this research and the, the, the applications there more accessible. Recently, 
for instance, in the direction of what, what's called, the, or what, what I would call retrieval augmentation uh, work that goes in the direction where the generative models can concentrate on what, they're really, what they should be really doing, and that is composing an answer, composing an image, and not so much memorizing all the images that are out there. And that leads to much smaller models, and at the end of the day, will bring all of you again back into the business, have models that you can use on your own machines and with that I believe like the creativity of the millions there will then again be able to shape the future work that we're seeing in that domain. And when you said at the beginning that it's uh, a stepping stone to getting to the ultimate direction, you think that means we are on the way to artificial general intelligence, do you? Um, that would be the ultimate place where we are, but I believe that even before we're getting to ultimate artificial intelligence that's really general in that direction, what we actually would want to get is an intelligence that's not just doing what it's trained for. See, we, we're now addressing complicated tasks such as generating images or generating text, but still that the algorithms are trained for exactly that. An intelligent butler, so to speak, what should that be able to do? It should be able to solve problems for you that it hasn't been trained on. So far, we call this programming, right? I, mean, I need to program a um, catered solution to a task that did not exist there beforehand. We see these ChatGPT and so on systems being able to generate code, but I would say this is more on the level of what they're generating in terms of text. It looks reasonable, but they're not software developers yet. If we're getting into that direction, I mean, that I see as the true challenge there, having your AI actually serve you, generate, and solve problems for you that you haven't conceived of in the training stage beforehand. Great, thank you very much, Bjorn. Uh, JP, you have a very broad perspective on the whole digital economy at the Web Science Trust, so can you help us understand how to conceptualize ChatGPT and generative AI more generally, and how does it fit into the overall picture? Sure. I mean, I, I, I've been more than just concerned about the level of hype that has been associated with ChatGPT, and I say that as a technophile. I have a, a pacemaker on steroids with a... Uh, a built-in defibrillator. I last died on the 27th of February last year and was brought back to life, you know, 30 seconds later. And I made a 40-year living in tech. So I am very supportive of tech, but I like to understand the bound and scope of what I'm dealing with. And recently I read a paper by a guy called Murray Shanahan, which pointed out that looking at large language models, which are fundamentally probability distributions of a very large corpus of words to try and determine what the next word sequence or token is, uh, has landed up with some learnings which are very trivial but could be very important. One, that the performance of these, these models scales more according to the size of the corpus than according to the complexity of the models although there is a model complexity implication. Two, that as that scale of corpus grows, so does the apparent quality of the output. There is an unreasonable effectiveness of what comes out. And the third, which is related to this unreasonable effectiveness, is that uh, it is performing tasks that we used to associate with human intelligence far better than we would have anticipated. So many things that are being reduced to being able to predict the next word are replacing things that we associated with being done by human intelligence. And working in technology for 40 odd years, I'm always interested in adoption and the social impact and saying, what skills don't we have that we need to use this technology? What skills do we have that we're going to lose as a result of this technology, and do we understand that well enough today before we unleash this into our environment? You know, I fear, you know, I, I was in Greece taking a car from a resort to the airport, and I saw this experienced driver go into a dead end, a cul-de-sac, clearly marked while driving me to the airport, and I knew it was because he couldn't afford the latest sat-nav, the map had changed, and he had lost the skill to use his brain to drive. 
Okay? We have children who can't remember phone numbers because as human beings, we've stopped doing that. So what is it we are going to lose when we say the tasks we used to use intelligence for are now being sort of offloaded to something as trivial as being able to predict the next word or token? In terms of what we don't have, I love Picasso's statement of computers are useless, they only give you answers. And when I was at school, uh, the first time I understood something about Socratic thinking, the Bengali teacher in this Jesuit school in Calcutta said, what I do not want you to do is to commit to memory and to vomit to paper, okay? <laughs> and sometimes what I see they only give you answers doing. There's no understanding of context or concept or anything else, but an incredible ability to parrot fashion an output. And we don't have the discernment and the skill to ask the right questions yet, and we don't yet have the judgment to know that the answer that we're given is right or not. And without those judgments and that learning, we are effectively going to become real, uh, you know, we're going to lose that ability to know what we're being given. And the worst example of that I know, and I'll stop with this, is I remember when Excel came out, okay? We lived in a culture where there was a machine room at the bottom of a building, the people who built the programs and queried the data were homegrown, the data was homegrown, and there was a mother's home cooking trust about the outputs. We knew the ingredients, we knew the environment, we knew the preparation process, and the output was trustworthy. And then we fast forward to anyone being able to edit anything in a democratized production world at the edge of Excel, and we outsource responsibilities all over the place, we create almost tunnels through our firewalls, and we get data from anywhere, and we place the same trust level on it because we have no training to do anything else. And that to me was like eating street food blindfolded and wondering why we're ill because we expected it to be home cooking. Right? When we know, don't know how to distrust, when we don't know how to question, when we don't know the scope and bound of what it is we're using, we run the risk of almost GMC type contamination of a larger and larger compass, a corpus of what is ingested, ingested without knowing how we can correct it. So I think there is an incredible potential for what we see, but the hype uh, makes me think only of Amara's law, that we are grossly overestimating the impact of this in the short run, and possibly grossly underestimating the impact of this in the long run. Wonderful. Thank you very much, JP. That's a great warning about our over-reliance on tech. It's sometimes called death by GPS syndrome, I think, isn't it? Um, maybe it should be death by GPT syndrome now. But John, you can... Uh, okay. Uh, it's, one, it's one of the... Oops. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, as one of the old lions, and having been uh, in AI when it was sort of uh, steam-driven, um, and... My interest is law, as early in the uh, AI um, lab at MIT, and interested in sort of language was the thing that really interested me. And sort of how, how could we infer from natural language and the mistakes that people make and deduce what the, was behind it, what created it? And I did my thesis, and I've talked companies about that. And so what's happening uh, here is really dramatic. I mean, I, it's like, my God, I didn't really think we could do these things. Particularly when you're saying it's sort of like based upon expected probabilities of different transitions is pretty true. The technology in some sense is trivial, though it's very, you, you have multiple layers, and it is sort of the, uh, the <laughs> robotic parrot that we've, uh, has been characterized as. I also think, to your point, uh, Marsh McLuhan made the point, is that uh, augmentation can lead to amputation. This is, and, and so what, what is going on? We are outsourcing part of ourselves to something we do not understand. 
Um, and it's to the machine. And, and, my, and part of the things that I've been really interested in is, is how do you create things based not on machines, but living things. So sort of moving away from this, uh, this, this great, and the, part of the, the idea of, of generalized AI is this concept of this all-knowing machine. And I, I, don't, I don't think that's an accurate picture. I don't think intelligence exists that way. I, I more believe as intelligence in a biological sense is sentience. And to be alive is to be sentient. To be sentient is to be alive and to be aware of what is going on. And so there's this real issue, I mean, we know, we've seen it in social media, that if, if, you're not, if, if, if you're not paying for something, you're the product, and they're taking information from you. And it's okay, it's one thing to have the demographic information taken from you, but it's another thing to have basically your soul, your the work product, your form of expression, who you are. And if that gets appropriated, then this creates really a, a pro most profound kind of alienation into the machine. And, and so just, I think, to the point that was made earlier is that these models don't necessarily have to be huge and centralized. They can be distributed. And this was where it becomes really important, and, and I've been doing a lot of work in decentralized identity and giving people control over their data, is that you really have to be in control of your model of yourself. If you do not control that, you're being controlled and you're being exploited. So the, the challenge here is not just a technological challenge, next generation AI. It's, it's, it's a foundational challenge in how we structure this. And, and it really, we have to think about authentication. Do we really understand where the sources are? We, can we do the attribution? And who's in control of it? And so that, I think it's going to be, it's not just the AI, it's the, it's the model. It's the financial, the business model becomes really important. So part of my interest has been actually how do you create, you don't, you, you create a system that's aware of itself that it reflects upon itself. It, is, it doesn't look at, at negative, externalities, negative things as externalities, but it's built to reflect upon itself and to be disclosed where and how it arrives at its conclusions. So it's, it's moving away from the machine as a centralized machine as to valuing every little form of life as having its own integrity and preserving that integrity. And that's a different paradigm. It's moving from machine to biology as a, as a principle. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, Michelle, can you give us your perspective? Yes, well, uh, you know, I think there's, as we know, there's tremendous possibility ahead of us with generative AI. I know the subsequent sessions will be focused more on that. The, the risks that I'm most concerned about, uh, that I think are absolutely uh, uh, important for all of us to know are first is the risk of bias in generative AI. And in fact, uh, OpenAI already lists the fact that gender bias and race bias is one of their risks in using OpenAI. And uh, it is uh, extraordinarily uh, rampant because we all contribute to the information out there that is uh, being spit out by generative AI. And guess what? We all have biases. And so, John, when you mentioned Sequoia's position about the trillions in, in economic uh, capital, the question is for whom? Uh, because we now know that generative AI is being used in very critical domains, policing as an example, facial detection, uh, uh, healthcare. Uh, and we know the research is very clear that bias leads to disparate outcomes and most importantly to fatal outcomes uh, for people of color, for women in law enforcement, in uh, health care, in the judicial system. So when you think about generative AI and uh, the content it's creating, uh, the way it's being used, in fact, uh, there's a mental health company that started to use a generative AI for, for chat functionality. Well, we know there's uh, extraordinary bias there, and it doesn't take into account also the nuances of individuals and different uh, people from different cultures and backgrounds. And so I think there's a lot of risk there. And, uh, you know, we, as we've seen very recently in the last decade, you have a lot of innovation that's, that's um, deployed in the world before we as a society are ready, you know, for it. And I think this is a critical area in that regard. The other risk I think is critical thinking skills. And JP, you kind of mentioned, you know, you alluded to that. Uh, so I, I think the more that we use these, in, in particular generative AI, we're going to see a loss of critical thinking skills and problem solving skills. And that's also a real impact that we need to be thinking about. Great, thank you very much, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Richard. 
there are a couple of different challenges and we won't have enough time to, to cover them all, but I'll, I'll do three quick ones. One is a predictive human challenge, another ethical and then a technical challenge. So concretely, when you're in the beginning of an exponential in, in nature or technology, it's very hard to know how long that exponential will keep going up as much and when it will flatten out. You know, when you think about like the first human guided flight, uh, and then a few decades later, we'd have, you know, machine guns on planes, flying loopings, and, and so on. If you c kept extrapolating the advantages of flight, you, we would all be hanging out on Mars once in a while and flying to the moon, have flying cars and all of that, but it completely flattened out in, you know, the 50s, 60s. Uh, and people didn't expect that. They kept thinking we're going to keep on innovating as much. Now, AI is digital. It has no more physical constraints, so we might stay on this kind of exponential improvement that we've been seeing in the last decade much, much longer. And it's very hard for humans to predict when it will flatten out an S-curve and when it will keep on going up. And sometimes it also, uh, we lack the creativity. Uh, so the second one is an ethical challenge. When you have generative AI that generates illustrations, for instance, or paintings, then there's the question, do you want to focus more on the folks right now who are making money and have jobs in generating beautiful imagery or illustrations, or do you want to just keep proliferating art and try to accelerate uh, and create more and more art on a massive scale, right? And the sort of current Luddites, not in the sense of trying to improve workers' compensation and things like that, but in the sense of being against uh, technology that takes away their jobs, are illustrators. Because you can say and ask a generative AI, create me a style of a cat in the style of this currently living illustrator who's making money creating that kind of illustration otherwise, if the AI didn't do it for me. And those folks are understandably mad at AI kind of taking their jobs. And, you know, I, I struggle with that because I understand where they're coming from, but I can also think about so many arguments of like why I wouldn't still want to fight this with trying to do copyright and, and so on and try to shut it down. You know, when people look at Monet and they're like, oh, I love this impressionistic style, I'm going to paint like that too. Monet isn't going to be like, no, don't, don't steal my style, you know? It's just like everyone is excited, there's a new form of art, of impressionism, and everyone kind of participates in it. Uh, but, you know, if Monet thought, well, if someone else paints this painting, then I can't sell mine anymore, then maybe it would have felt differently. But it is overall, I think, an increasing pie. Uh, but nonetheless, there are a lot of ethical challenges. And then, maybe quickly, there's some concrete technical challenges. So, you mentioned ChatGPT. Uh, there are, you know, basically people don't necessarily know when to trust the model and when not. And that's partially because the model doesn't know when you want to just jam and brainstorm on some novel ideas versus you want to actually look up a fact. And just like when the internet came out and people trusted everything that's on the internet and you're still trying to tell sometimes some folks don't trust everything you read on the internet, it's the same thing with ChatGPT. Don't trust everything it says. But at the same time, I think if you say, oh, because that is the current V1 of that technology and because it cannot do this particular thing, it will never be able to do it, I think you're just lacking creativity at that point because even if you chat, which came out of three weeks after ChatGPT, we now have more often citations and we are more often factual. We're not always factual, but a lot of the problems that we have, I think there are clear technical challenges, but also solutions to them. And in the next few weeks, we're going to, again, release a version of this kind of technology where it will know when to just not say something and show you other kinds of information. So you ask it, like, what was the Tesla stock at 3 p.m. yesterday? And it might not know, but it might know to show you how, where, what it is. Uh, and just show you a multimodal output and then you have a better interaction with that system. So when people say, oh, I will never be able to do this, I'm just like, you know this. Like, you could say the same thing about the iPhone or the internet and electric cars. Like, sure, in the beginning, most technologies are not that great. But when there's so much excitement and you're beginning of an exponential, you just make it better. Great. Well, I think collectively we've um, come up with a lot of challenges uh, and I don't think we've listed them all either. I mean, I think there's also the environmental challenge of using these massively energy consumptive models as well and the problems that, that has. Uh, we have very little time left. I just want to kind of throw in one extra kind of issue, which is some people talk about paternalistic or libertarian AI. And Mark Andreessen um, tweeted recently, 
the level of censorship pressure that's coming for AI and the resulting backlash will define the next century of civilization. Search and social media were the opening skirmishes. This is the big one. World War Orwell, whatever that means. Um, but uh, I think you can rely on Andreessen to come up with some big thinking. But I think it gets to the point of should we have guardrails on this or not? Um, and I think that's obviously a big uh, difference between Google at the moment, who have a relatively constrained model in Lambda, which they're applying internally, and clearly OpenAI who are open, and Stable Diffusion, who are opening it up. So maybe, Bjorn, if I could give you the final word on this, because you have been working very closely uh, with Stable Diffusion. But paternalistic or libertarian? I think I can guess which one you're going to go for. But um, when we developed what's now called stable diffusion, there was at an inflection point where we thought like you wait a tiny bit more and then you probably can fake images and it will be hard to distinguish. Back then, I feel like that was the time where you could easily release the model as it was, like very openly, and with that stir this debate, have everybody realized that images were never real, the reality, there was always this tendency of having that represented in a different way, but I believe research in that direction at the very least should be open, artists should be able to opt out, yeah, there we should have freedom, but overall our society should make the final call where we would go with that and not just me as a researcher working in that domain. Okay, well, I'm sure that the, one of the subsequent panels on the ethics of AI is going to return to that issue. But um, in the meantime, thank you very much to all of our panelists who I think gave a fantastic overview of the opportunities and challenges. Thank you.